really when we're coming together as adults, our aim is to learn and connect. And actually learning is such a joyful experience. And I think one of the tenets that we tried to do is it's okay to have joy. It's okay to bring joy. It's okay to have serendipity. It's okay to let people run stuff. It's okay to prototype because we were trying a lot of things. And I will tell you, we were nervous about it. This is High and Box. I'm Alec Patton, and that was the voice of Laura McBain. In this episode, Laura is interviewed by Michelle Pledger, Director of Liberation at the High Tech High Graduate School of Education. And I don't want to say anything more because this interview is just awesome and I want to get right into it. Here's Michelle. Well, I am thrilled and excited to be here with none other than Laura McBain, Co-Managing Director of Stanford D School and K-12 Lab Co-Director. And I just want to know, Laura, just for people who haven't met you yet and can't see you right now. Can you just go ahead and share some aspects of your identity so listeners can get a sense of how you move through the world? Sure. Um, One, this is such a blast uh, to reconnect with the amazing Dr. Pledger. Uh, We've had a long history of of shaking things up in education. So it's fun to have a a reflection conversation about (laughs) where deeper learning has been and where it's going. Yeah, my name is Laura McBain. I am the co-managing director of the D-School and also co-lead the K-12 lab. Um, I have been a lifelong educator, I think for like 20 years now. I am a white cisgender designer. My job or my role and my values is really around how I help people see the world through a more ethical and equitable lens and, you know, give people their capacities to create radical things in the world to make the lives of young people um, better and more just. Whew. Okay, that's a lot, especially this creation of radical things to make the world a more just place. So can you give us a sense? I imagine your days are different and filled with all kinds of incredible opportunities. But what exactly do you get to do in the world in in these roles that you described? Yeah, so I, you know, I was part of High Tech High. I was a founding teacher of High Tech High. Um, I was a principal. I helped found our graduate school of education. I was the original architect of the Deeper Learning Conference. And so, you know, I consider myself a, I would say, a learning experience designer and just designer outright. And so what I do now currently is I lead some design strategy work at the D school, which is organizational design, helping us think about who we want to become in the next 15 years. And what is the role that design can play in really creating and shaping the future. So what that looks like in reality is, you know, my team and our crew, we take on what we call a lot of experiments or explorations. We look at, I would say, pockets or areas or things that are rather invisible um, within education, really find new ways to think about issues in education differently or reframe problems in education quite differently. A couple examples of that a couple of years ago, as Michelle knows, we took on a project that was focused on deeper learning, but really focused on how we assess deeper learning, particularly looking at collaboration, critical thinking and problem solving. And many people think about that and they're like, oh, I got another rubric. I got to assess the students with a test. Maybe we'll do a presentation of learning. But what we did uh, is we realized through our own explorations that escape rooms are a really amazing performance assessment of how you can actually see collaboration and communication in action. And so, you know, that project in particular was a way for us to help educators not just see, yes, I should, you know, really assess collaboration and communication, but actually know what it looks like when you see it. And so that project was aimed at helping educators really reimagine not just how they understand those key deeper learning competencies, but actually they can have how, how they can help young people see it for themselves and reflect on when they're doing it really well. Um, so that's just one of the many projects that we do, but it's really around, you know, finding pockets or unsolved intractable problems in education and finding, I would say, novel ways to approach them and providing really creative solutions that everyone can kind of take up and use. Yeah. And I I love how escape rooms really get at almost all of the six deeper learning competencies. And for our listeners, just in case you're unaware of the competencies, I'll just share them with you briefly. The six DL competencies are content expertise, critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, effective communication, self-directed learning, and academic mindset. So you can definitely get more information about those in the show notes. And these deeper learning competencies 
you know, people use them, mix them, mash them up in all these different ways. But there was something that happened about a decade ago where y'all said, okay, we need to have a deeper <laughs> learning conference. So please uh, tell me the story of how the deeper learning conference came to be. Just take us back to a decade ago and how all this started. I mean, I think it would be ridiculous for us to not to mention the acknowledgement or acknowledge the work that Barbara Chow, who was the head of the Hewlett Foundation for seven years, um, who really, really developed the deeper learning competencies and connection to researchers. And of course, the amazing support and leadership that Mark Chun, who was of the, the Hewlett Foundation for seven years, did early days when the Hewlett Foundation got together. They put together what we call these 10 communities of practice, 10 COPs. We called it the COP. And it was 10 schools around the country that we would ourselves weren't calling ourselves deeper learning schools. We were just doing work that we think is interesting in schools. Um, that network included High Tech High, Big Picture Learning, PBL Works, uh, New Tech Network, um, Envisions a whole swath of schools and organizations that were aspiring to bring what I would consider just basic, good, progressive pedagogy to schools. And we were all doing it slightly in different ways. Some ran networks where they provided tools and resources to districts, high tech high, you know, we ran schools, big picture learning, equipped schools around the world to think about how they can blend academic internships in schools to real world learning. So we were all approaching, I would say, this progressive area of education slightly different. And what the deeper learning of the Hewlett group did is they brought us together and they said, you all are the you all are doing great work together. How do we actually help more people understand and see how to do this within their own region and within their own context? And one of the levers that we did beyond um, that, I think the Hewlett Foundation did in particular, that was quite smart is that they developed um, research and practice um, groups. So they had, they were investing in research. I was like, how do we know this work? How do we know this stuff is working? They invested in policy, um, which is how do we ensure that the government adoption is looking at this? And then of course they invent, they really looked at evaluation. They studied these schools for over 10 years, um, looking at longitudinal studies about does a young person who goes to a deeper learning school, will they graduate at higher rates? And they do. That's actually the result of the West End study that came out. But the hunch about bringing these folks together is that all these folks in this group, we all trained educators. And we knew that one of the levers to bring people together was, yes, a conference, but really the aim was to help other people understand what deeper learning is and how you can do it within your context. And so I think we're up at a a grant meeting and we were having conversations about how to scale this work. And there was lots of different things happening. And the Deeper Learning Conference was not the only thing. There is a series of Edutopia videos that got launched that are still available. There's a a whole series of uh, blogs on deeper learning that was sponsored by Ed Week. Um, There was a lot of research initiatives that were happening around the country. Um, There was a deeper learning leadership forum that focused on leaders doing this in their own context. So when the call came to be is like, who wants to host a conference? Your colleague and my former colleague, Ben Daly said, we'll host it. We'll do it. Uh, sure. We've done, we do conferences all the time. High Tech High did those kind of gatherings for years, um, even since the early days. And so we were most equipped to host a space. We were never intended to hold the conference forever. We actually were the ones to say, we'll do it the first year. Anyone else is welcome to take over. From there, I think we were really intentional in the first couple of years of making it an experience where it wasn't an event for high tech high. It was an event for the deeper learning community. And that meant that we called it the deeper learning conference um, that happened to be held in San Diego at a high tech high school. But the event itself was never really about high tech high. It was about profiling and featuring the great work of the community this deeper learning COP that was doing to advance deeper learning. And our job was really just to amplify and elevate the great work of all the schools that were in this uh, community of practice. Wow. I just learned something because I had no idea that we had only committed to just posting that first year and that it was going to hopefully rotate around. But um, anyway, here we are, it's still being hosted. We uh, hope that was the case. We were hoping people would jump in, you know, we're like, ah, you know, like, should we do it? And You know, we were hesitant, I will say, because that puts a lot of weight on high tech high at the day. And um, 
you know, we were hoping potentially, but again, you know, the grant, we agreed to host it. And I'm sure within the grant, there was probably like, we'll host it for three years, but you know, something like that. I'm sure there was some language, but you know, you know, as, as the organizer, you know, we were like, yeah, we don't have to hold it. We just happen to be holding the space this year. Ah, okay. Well, I think you, or I know you've, did an excellent job in those origins. And even when it became a conference at High Tech High, I was continuing to hold to find so many ways for all of the community of practice, deeper learning orgs to participate and be involved and lead elements of it, whether that was through dens or deep dives or social gatherings and things like that. So I think we're hoping a decade later, even though you have moved on, that we we're hopefully still carrying that legacy and that hope that you had at the beginning um, in terms of keeping it as integrated and as inclusive as possible. So now that you are, we're about 10 years into this, if you could go back in time, knowing all of the brilliant things that Laura McBain knows now <laughs> about the world of education, about deeper learning, about policy, about all of this, if you could go back in time at the start of this, like what would you have told yourself back then? That's a really great question. I mean, I think one of the things that we were starting to figure out back then, and it was really early, but it was like some inklings, it's like continuing to be bold. I think that one of the things that I think is a signature of of some of the experiences of deeper learning is that you get out of the building you do things that educators and young people do. So we actually put educators in the role of being a student, you know, exhibitions of learning. They're actually experiencing learning for themselves and really diving in. And I think as someone who's leading conferences and things like that, we tend to like, let's make sure that we make sure it's really high, you know, fidelity and make sure that it's conference is a you know adult conference. But here's the thing is like, really when we're coming together as adults, our aim is to learn and connect. And actually learning is such a joyful experience. And I think one of the tenets that we tried to do is it's okay to have joy. It's okay to bring joy. It's okay to have serendipity. It's okay to let people run stuff. It's okay to prototype because we were trying a lot of things. And I will tell you, we were nervous about it. I remember the very first year of the den, um, we started these, I had gone um, to a bunch of conferences to kind of experience what's out there in the world. And I went to South by Southwest early and I came back. And I told Ben, I said, we got to create these lounges because I found that the best conversations I had at this conference was in the lounge. And then Ben and I were like, well, yeah, the best conversations I have at a conference is in the hallway. So we're like, well, what is that? That's an unmet need. That's an area that's like the interstitial space at conferences. And so from there, you know, we we designed this lounge space where we literally like took over one of our old hallway buildings. I just remember stapling things to a wall, finding furniture, like there were bathrooms. It was a hot mess um, <laughs> for sure, I remember. And I didn't know it would be a thing. I was like, let's just try this. Let's try this little den. Let's take over this small area. And Michelle knows the space of this school. And I remember that first year and it was packed in that space we couldn't even like get there was it was standing room only and it was hot because there was so many people in the space um it was one of those things as an organizer we have to follow our instinct and we have to look for i would have continued to look what is the unmet need in this group right now Mm. what's the thing that's not being met in this community and so looking back i think would have been really interesting to like continue to ask people not just did they have a great time at the conference, they did, but like what need has not been met yet for them to activate and accelerate deeper learning in their conference? What's the need they don't have yet and what's not being seen? And I think we could have done a better job really understanding the users in the early stages so that they could really take this work back and really activate it and implement it in the region. All right. So Deeper learning is still happening, thankfully, in the world. And in the work you do now, because you're out, you're in so many different spaces, what are some of the most powerful examples of deeper learning that you've observed or you've experienced? I mean, I think one thing about deeper learning is that this is always the challenge is that it's tough to see it sometimes. People, I think, get confused by there's like these six competencies, Michelle, that you named of just like you're the six. And they all are kind of fluid. You know, they happen, they're ubiquitous. And I think for me, some of the best, you know, examples, of course, of deeper learning is in with schools, you know, helping schools take on some projects. I've seen great examples of projects in Australia, 
Virginia, uh, Chicago, uh, where, you know, you and I had personal experience. I will say, I think one of the most rewarding projects that I think you and I probably got to work on was working in a school um, in Pilsen, Chicago, you know, in, in Illinois, in the south side of Chicago, where I think you and I were a little hesitant about like, how is this even going to translate to the young people there? And I think one of the things that you and I could probably agree upon is like the idea that the young people in this school are going to get excited about their learning and they're going to show up is pretty powerful. I remember, Michelle, you and I went to their very first exhibition and it was like winter and it was cold and you and I had <laughs> and time in the cold. It was freezing. And we went to the exhibition and I remember you and I were talking with a couple of the teachers and one of the teachers that I think you and I talked with said, like, I don't think my kids are going to show up. And he's like, they haven't done the work. They're not going to show up to this. They're no, then the kids are showing up. And we're like, well, let's just see what happens. <laughs> yep. we, had faith. we had faith in this process and this system that like, you know, if you do really cool projects that embed deeper learning, kids will show up. And almost, I think almost every kid showed up. And I remember, I mean, this is a very small moment, but I remember there were two kids in particular who showed up to the exhibition. And I remember talking to the teacher and he's like, and they started hanging up stuff. They started helping. They were on the ladders trying to get the space ready. And then the project was like, they didn't even do the project <laughs> <laughs> to make the work sing. And I think that's just like a very small example. I remember that of those early days. And it just had a renewed faith of like, when you give young people the capacity to show their brilliance, they will show up. Yeah. And even now you and I probably follow their Instagram. They're still doing great work. They continue to do amazing work with young people. What I just saw something today from like pottery, they're doing showcases. And so, you know, that was one example that, you know, you and I sparked and now is taking on his life of his own. I feel we, I feel like I'm proud of that work. And I think you are too, is like, here's a school that like took this and did it in a way that made sense to them. You know, it wasn't something we said, this is the prescription. You got to follow it. It was about how this work shows up in their context. And I think, um, you know, for me, I think looking back over time, it was a blast of a project and we got to do great work, but seeing the young people continue to do really powerful, um, deeper learning projects now, even now, um, is really inspiring. Yeah. And so much, I totally agree. I remember working on that incredible three-year project with you at that school. And just, that's what's so powerful, I think, about the deeper learning conference experience is that folks get to actually experience what it feels like. And the hope is not so that they then go and replicate exactly what happened because their context is different, right? Their young people are different, but it's that inspiration, that belief in what is possible, right? And like, just like you said, like when we we create that space, right, for kids to show up and be brilliant, they already are brilliant. We're, it's just all about us shaping that path, supporting them in the ways they need to be supported, but it can happen everywhere. Because I used to I'm sure you've heard the critique of like, oh, that's high tech high. They can do that there or, or that's this region. And we know, right, that we see deeper learning happening in rural spaces, in urban spaces, in spaces with uh, like less resources. Right. So it's possible even at the re recent deeper learning uh, Boston conference. Right. We were for our deep dives. We were literally in the woods. No technology. Right. So you that wasn't an excuse like and we were experiencing deeper learning with no tech, no computers, just the outdoors. Right. And human beings. <laughs> That's really all we needed in that moment. Right. So um, it just it really this whole idea, this movement of moving from just the San Diego conference. And now we're moving into having more regional conferences through deeper learning global just to demonstrate that this is possible. There is brilliance and expertise in every single region. And it's about how are we leveraging that brilliance, connecting those humans to each other uh, to just continue to serve young people. So I, my final question for you is around just as you, cause you do a lot of futurism work as well as my understanding. So you're thinking a lot about the future. So what are your hopes for the future of deeper learning? Yeah. So one of the projects right now that I, I'm working on is really at the intersection of futures thinking, uh, design and equity and how, you know, really how educators can see and use the practices and approaches of futures thinking and education because educators are futurists. We are shaping the future every day. And one of the areas that 
you know, we kind of um, tagline within our work is most educators right now, we have this like, I've, you and I've been at conferences many times where like educators must prepare young people for the future that does not exist. Now, as an educator, I was like, that's insane. Like, I, how am I supposed to do that? The world doesn't even exist yet. And I'm supposed to do this too. <laughs> like, it's a little bit of a high bar to me. And we realized, you know, really ultimately, and I think deeper learning has a role to play here, is that we need to move beyond, you know, preparing young people for a future that may or may not exist, but really giving them the, the skills and capacity to shape the future in the way that they see fit. And so it's moving from preparing to shaping. And I think one of the deep things that I think come of the deeper learning work, especially in this moment, that I think is probably extremely important. You know, there's an article that came out this morning in the Atlantic about the end of English. You and I were, in, you know, humanities English teachers. Um, and we're seeing the evolution of AI, like open AI that's coming up, that's writing prose. Some of it's good. Some of it's probably has ethical and uh, bias that's embedded in it. A lot of that. But I do think it really challenges us to think about agency in a new way of how we equip young people with a sense of self-determination and capacity to really shape the world that they need to see happen in the future. And so I think when I think about the deeper learning, I think there needs to be a rework of thing mastering content in the 10 years that deeper learning has been going on. We have seen a massive uptick in AI, right? concept consumption. We saw we had Khan Academy, you know, probably 10 years ago. Now we have computers that are writing essays for us. Like that's happening. And so we really have to think about what does it mean to master, you know, content consumption that we're talking about, but create with new content, I think is a really area of, of investigation that um, I think the deeper learning movement really to think about is what does it mean when we think about the content area that um, that first competency has is what does it mean around content, which I think is an area to really play into. Um, and then I do think this sense of agency is probably really, really important. Um, you know, one of the things that we think about within the future is that while we not may not predict it, we can get better and anticipating and seeing the signals and seeing how the world can unfold. One of the things that I think is really interesting about futures work is what we call trend casting which is looking backwards and forwards and seeing how trends unfold. Mm -hmm. One of them being emerging technology is a trend, right? I would say economic injustice is a trend, you know, all these things that are happening in the world. And I think one of the areas that we get excited about, which is really a high level of agency, is equipping educators and young people with the capacity to start seeing signals, to start seeing how the world is changing so that the future doesn't happen to them. And that is the type of thing that I think deeper learning can help us do. When we're talking about learning to learn. We're talking about agency. But I think futures thinking and, and this connection to agency is really important, is allowing people to like have the skill sets and the capacity to, to, see the, to see the future so that they are developing the careers of the future, not just getting ready for the job that's going to come at them. You know, 10 years ago, we were telling educators that everyone needs to be a coder. I am sitting here in Silicon Valley. That may or may not be the case anymore, given the way that technology is moving. So I think, you know, deeper learning has this capacity to really help young people think about how they really play with content and interrogate content, actually. Because if computers are creating the content, what is our role? And I think our role is around interrogating the content that gets created through these massive technologies. That has a role that critical thinking um, and deeper learning has to play. And then, of course, like really helping people young people in particular create, you know, the power of creation and the power of creating something that did not exist before gives people, I think everyone, whether a young person, or an educator, uh, the feeling that you have some power. And in a world that's radically changing um, in this vocal world that we call, I think tapping into your own capacity and belief system that you actually have a voice in how this future will unfold and you actually have the capacity to shape it is not just a deeper learning question, you know, it's an education question. And I think the deeper learning community in particular is actually quite poised to play a role in that. Whew, oh my goodness. There, there's so much there that we're going to have to probably have a part two uh, that's focused just on the futurism and the intersection of design and equity in the future. That, wow, I'm not, you got you have my mind racing right now of thinking about what does that look like? What could that mean? And what types of like workshop deep dives experiences would you want to make sure are happening at a deeper learning conference 
But I just want to thank you so much for all of your time, Laura. You have been, side note to everyone here, like Laura has just been an integral part of how, where I am today because she was believing in me way back when, when I wasn't even believing in myself and I was just really trusting in her belief of me to get some things going. And it just opens, you open so many doors for me, Laura, and I'm so grateful. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to just chat a little bit yeah. about this past decade of deeper learning. And I hope uh, we get to hear more from you soon. <laughs> Awesome. And I, I love you, Michelle. And I'm so proud of the work y'all are doing. It's really cool to see this work and you living in the world in such brave and bold ways. Um, and so it's such an honor and I'm excited for what y'all cook up. <laughs> Thank you, friend. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. High Tech High Unbox is hosted and edited by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel. Huge thanks to Michelle Pledger and Lauren McBain for this interview. There are links to lots of great resources in the show notes. Thanks for listening.